reason that we're talking is because we are in this period now where it's about the one year mark since uh, Virginia started seeing its first confirmed cases of coronavirus. And I guess what we wanted to do is sort of start off by just asking you about the first stages of the pandemic as a state leader, when you first learned that these cases were being confirmed in Virginia, take us through the process of how you, your administration, public health officials on the state level, take us through the process of how you digested that information and how you acted on it. Well, first of all, Nick, thanks for having me with you today. And I, I certainly hope that your listeners are staying healthy and safe and their families are as well. Um, it's hard to believe, uh, but our first case was on March the 7th, uh, almost a year ago. Um, and we've come a long way since then. There were a tremendous amount of unknowns. And you know, I, I was in the army, Nick. Uh, I served as a, a doctor in the army. And I was uh, practiced medicine for about 25 years after that. But uh, we were asked to fight a biological war when I say we, uh, governors, uh, as leaders of our states, to, to fight a biological war without any supplies uh, and without any guidance uh, from, from Washington. And, you know, some of the things that I remember from early on uh, were just our, our access to testing um, and the uh, initial tests that we had, uh, which were not very many, were being sent to Atlanta uh, to the CDC with turnaround times of like two weeks. And uh, so it's very frustrating. And then obviously the, the fight uh, to, uh, to gather PPE, uh, governors were literally competing with each other for that. Uh, and then testing capabilities. And you know, we, we ramped up to 10,000 and then now we're testing well over 20, sometimes 30,000 individuals a day. So we've learned a lot. Uh, as I said, there were a lot of unknowns, but we've had a great team here uh, in, in Richmond. We have what we call a situation room uh, where we meet uh, uh, almost every day. Uh, back in the early days, we were meeting uh, every day. As you probably remember, we were having press conferences uh, every day. And you know, people from our Department of Public Safety, uh, our Department of Emergency Management, our Secretary of Health, our Commissioner of Health, People have literally been working uh, around the clock uh, since back in March. And uh, as, as I said earlier, we're in a much, much better place, but it's been a very busy year. And it's been a difficult year, Nick, for Virginians and, and Americans for that part. But uh, our children have sacrificed, uh, families have sacrificed businesses, uh, employment. We had over 1.3 million individuals file for unemployment. Um, our nurses and, and doctors and providers uh, have worked around the clock. And I couldn't be prouder uh, of the response that we've had uh, in Virginia, uh, but it's been a difficult year for everybody. And now there's finally some hope and light at the end of a long, dark tunnel with the vaccinations. And uh, we're doing well in that regard. And, you know, hopefully by the summertime, uh, we'll be able to put this pandemic for the most part in the rearview mirror. About a year ago, I can tell you, and I'm sure you know, that there was some panic among just the general population in Virginia and Maryland, in the DC metro area. Uh, people were panic buying. Uh, homeowners, business owners were not sure what was about to happen. Uh, during that time, can you tell us if there was any panic among you, your administration, state leadership? Was there a feeling of, uh, of panic and uncertainty? What was, what was the feeling as you were trying to be a leader during such a strange and difficult time? Well, certainly, Nick, there were a lot of concerns uh, from me and, and from our staff and, and from Virginians because there were so many unknowns and, and the numbers continue to increase every day. You know, the number of cases, the number of individuals that were sick, uh, ending up in the hospital, the, the deaths uh, started. And, and it was very frustrating because we had a president at that time that said that this was under control, uh, said that everybody could get a test, that it was a great test, that the, that the virus, like a miracle, was going to go away. Meanwhile, uh, it didn't. Um, and so, you know, we, we met every day uh, and, and we used science, we used data, um, and we made our decisions based on that. And I think some of the early decisions that we made were difficult, such as closing schools, but they were the right thing to do uh, at that time. And I think they saved lives. And I think that they, it really kept that curve uh, uh, as flat as we could 
uh, to, you know, to keep our capacity in our hospitals where we needed it. Uh, so overall, um, you know, things went well. We're in a much better place today than we were a year ago. We've learned so much. It's uh, been a, a certainly a challenging year, but uh, we're, we're going to get through this. Is there anything you look back on and you wish you would have done differently? If you could go back, would you change any of those decisions that you made early on? Well, the thing that was so frustrating for me, especially as a doctor and a scientist, was the, the fact that you know, we knew that masks work. We knew that if we kept our social distancing, washed our hands, this is the way you know, we could control, control the spread of this. And we were not getting that support and, and message from Washington. And it became partisan. It became political. And it's, you know, it's really frustrating to think that you know, whether someone should wear a mask or not was you know, political. That's, that's just wrong. And again, I, I was in the Army. I, you know, I, I fought uh, on foreign soil for our, our country. Um, and you know, people worked together during that conflict. I, I fought during Desert Storm. Um, and to see us fighting this biological war with a president that was given mixed messages and, and telling people that they didn't need to wear a mask. That, and, and you remember uh, the, the president actually announced that, well, we should wear a mask and that we should keep our distance. And two days later, he said, liberate Virginia and had people you know, threatening me, threatening uh, our capital city here in, in Richmond. And so, you know, looking back on it, that, that was very frustrating. And uh, I don't think was uh, in the best interest of Virginia, certainly wasn't in the best interest of this country. So did you as a doctor always think when you first heard about the pandemic and how serious it might be, did you think that we would all be wearing masks, walking around wearing masks and, and ha have these mask mandates? Did you think that actually we would be under such a situation even a year after it started? It's a great question, Nick. And you know, as a as a physician, uh, I dealt with respiratory viruses, uh, with influenza, which we we deal with each year, and most of those are seasonal. You know, we have uh, very busy months, usually in the latter part of December, January, and February, and then with the warmer weather, you know, the the virus kind of goes away. But this one was unrelenting, and I knew. Uh, after a few weeks that uh, we were in for a long haul. And again, that's why we made the decisions that we made to, to shut down our schools, to, um, you know, to, to have curfews, to stay at home orders, all of these things. Uh, and they were, you know, they, I think they worked, but they were, it was difficult for Virginia, um, but it was the right thing to do. Okay, so on the topic of schools, uh, many school systems in Virginia are now offering in-person classes what are your thoughts on when all schools will be offering perhaps all in-person classes? And also a second part of that question, how long do you think virtual classes should be offered to families? Well, let me answer the, the second part of your question first. And that is that we need to get our children back into school. Uh, we need to do it safely and responsibly. Um, uh, but our children have sacrificed as have their families uh, over this past year. So I've made uh, vaccinating our teachers a priority and, and now close to 70% of our teachers uh, have been vaccinated. So I, I feel good about that. But Nick, I have worked very closely with our Department of Education, our Secretary of Education, Adif Carney. Um, and we knew from the beginning that one size doesn't fit all in Virginia. We live in a very uh, diverse Commonwealth. And so we have allowed the school districts to use their discretion we have provided them with the best data that we can for them to make decisions. Uh, but we know we need our children back in school. And so a couple of weeks ago, uh, as you may uh, know, I uh, strongly encouraged uh, all of our school districts uh, to start making plans, not only to get our children back into the classroom, but also to add some days on this summer so that we can help our children get uh, caught up for the time that they have lost. And now all but two, of 132 school districts have come on board uh, and we're working very closely with those two. Uh, one is right here in Richmond, the other is in Sussex County. And I expect them to have plans in the near future, uh, not only to help get our children back in school, but also to help this summertime uh, with getting our kids caught up so that everybody will be ready to go uh, in the fall. Okay, I guess just, um, just to touch on this, and it's maybe a little bit of a hypothetical question, 
uh, or a completely hypothetical question, but uh, what, happen, what would happen if the schools never closed completely, I guess, because we're talking about evidence that suggests that the coronavirus doesn't easily spread in schools, uh, students are better protected, things like that. Um, do you still support the decision to completely close schools? And, and maybe what do you think the worst would have been if schools didn't close completely? Yeah, Nick, we, we didn't know, you know, back in, in March and, and April, and there were just, there were so many unknowns. Uh, we saw that community spread was occurring and increasing. Um, and we, you know, we have learned so much about this. Obviously, children uh, can contract the coronavirus. Their outcomes are better. But we've all had a number of children, uh, as you know, that have had the multi-system inflammatory uh, disease uh, that, uh, that we've had to treat them for. So, um, so we did the right thing. Uh, now we know uh, after a year uh, that schools, especially if they're able to follow the mitigation measures, are some of the safest places to be. Uh, and we've seen that with our child care. Uh, our child care you know, facilities never were shut down, a lot of them, and they've done very well. There have been very few outbreaks. So, so we're going to continue to follow the guidelines and, and the mitigation measures and, and work with our schools. But I, I think we can safely I know we can safely get our children, you know, back into schools. And, and again, as a, as a pediatric neurologist, uh, I have a lot of colleagues, as you might imagine, that I, I talk to frequently. Our children have suffered. Uh, the mental health, the mental illnesses, uh, the, the number of prescriptions that are being written for antidepressants, uh, for stimulants, the number, the amount of counseling uh, that is needed. We need to get our children back into schools. That's in their best interest. And I also believe it's in our family's best interest. You and the First Lady both tested positive for the coronavirus at one point. Um, can you walk us through how that affected you physically and also, I guess, mentally as well as you, as you were a leader during this entire thing, a state leader? Uh, how did it affect you as far as your outlook on, on tackling these problems that came about because of the pandemic? Well, I appreciate the question, Nick. And I, I went home. Uh, one afternoon from work in September, and uh, they notified my wife Pam uh, and me that uh, one of our employees in the ha home that we live in uh, had tested positive, and so we needed to test, and, and also all of the staff uh, that I was um, in contact with needed to test, and, and I know we'll forget that evening. Uh, they, they called my wife and, and told her that she was positive, and and then they said, I need to talk to your husband as well. And I picked up the phone and because uh, I was totally asymptomatic. And, and when they said, uh, Governor Northam, your test came back positive. I mean, it, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And, uh, uh, you know, I was worried about Pam, obviously worried about our employees. Um, and for about six days, I felt fine. And then I started getting some mild symptoms. Uh, the worst, Nick, was losing my sense of smell, and to date, it still hasn't returned. So, really, you know, maybe soon uh, it will. But one of the things I want to say that of uh, why we know that wearing masks and keep our social distancing works. I was in contact when they did the tracing, and as for Pam and me, with about sixty-five very close uh, people: uh, my press secretary, our security. Uh, the folks that I work with every day, we have been very careful about wearing masks and keeping our distance. And not one, not one of those 65 folks that were tested were positive. And, and that just tells us that, you know, the things that we're, you know, talking about every day, they work. And, and so uh, my wife, Pam, uh, is doing fine. She's totally recovered. As soon as I get my sense of smell back, I will uh, be happy. But uh, we're just fortunate Nick, that we had mild cases. Obviously, uh, a lot of Virginians, a lot of Americans didn't. We've lost over 7,000 Virginians to COVID, and um, I feel for every one of those uh, individuals' families. And uh, we'll continue to do everything that we can to keep Virginians safe and to put this pandemic behind us. Okay, so I can't quite get past this for a moment here. You you still don't have your, your sense of, you just don't smell anything, or do you smell a little bit, or... How are you still affected by this? I can't, you know, Nick, I, I can't smell anything. Um, wow. I, I, I drink a cup of coffee 
in the morning. I like to eat peanut butter uh, on occasion. Um, obviously, things like toothpick, uh, tooth, toothpaste, uh, you know, peppermint chewing gum, nothing. Um, so I look forward to the day when I can uh, have my sense of smell back. Wow, that's, you know, I've heard so many people have that who uh, go through COVID, and it just sounds um, sounds life changing, really. I mean, that's. That's incredible that so many months later that you're still experiencing that. That's really incredible. And not to get into the weeds too much, but it's especially interesting to me as a, as a neurologist, mm -hmm. because I understand a little bit about the way our sense of smell works and whether it be a peripheral problem or a central problem. And, and uh, I haven't figured that out either. So it's uh, something I can work on down the road. Okay. I want to ask you a, a kind of a difficult question. Um, you know, uh, about a year before the pandemic hit, you had a scandal. There was the yearbook photo that came out, the racist yearbook photo uh, of the man in the KKK outfit and the man in blackface. Did you find that that impacted your ability to lead? Because there was there were a lot of calls for you to resign. So for, for you to go from that to uh, uh, just a, the, the, the total spotlight role of being the leader of a state during this a uh, terrible pandemic. Did you find that any of the scandal affected your credibility or your ability to lead? Can you tell us a little bit about how you overcame that or, or maybe did not overcome, overcome it completely? Well, that was a difficult time for uh, Virginia, uh, but you know, I'm pleased that Virginians stood with me. Um, and while we worked on a lot of equitable issues uh, prior to, uh, to that uh, uh, event, um, you know, we have learned a lot. I've traveled around Virginia uh, and listened to a lot of individuals. And when I listen, I, I learn. And uh, the more I know, the more I can do. And so one of the things that we have really been able to focus on uh, is the inequities uh, that, that existed uh, prior to COVID-19. But COVID-19 has really brought those into much stronger focus. And inequities like access to education and health care, the criminal justice system, voting, business opportunities, environmental justice, all of these things have been brought into better focus during COVID-19. And, and our staff, our administration, uh, has made, made those a, a top issue. And, and I think if Virginians look and see what we've been able to accomplish, uh, whether it was in the special session uh, back in the fall of 2020, or in the session that will be ending hopefully this weekend, a lot of gains have been made. And I, I really think that uh, because of that, Virginia will come out of COVID-19 in a much stronger position than when we went into COVID-19. Let's talk just a little bit about vaccinations. I know it's an ongoing situation, changing by the day sometimes. What would you say to someone who is uh, maybe in a high-risk group, maybe on the borderline of a high-risk group, someone like that who can't get a vaccine, who really wants one, who feels they need one, What's your message to someone like that who's, who's pleading with the state, you know, help me get a vaccine. Um, what do you have to say to someone like that? Well, a couple of points I would make, Nick. Um, you know, the vaccination process started back in, in late December. And I recognized after a couple of weeks, it was not going as well as I had anticipated and as I wanted. And I made some adjustments. I, I brought in a, a czar, if you will, a, a field general that was uh, it's overseeing uh, the vaccination process, Dr. Danny Avula, who's doing great work. I set goals, uh, initially 25,000 shots a day. Uh, now we're close to 50,000 shots a day. We've actually vaccinated over 1.7 million Virginians. Uh, we started a centralized registration system. Over a half a million individuals have already registered for that. We have a call center uh, where we receive calls in person uh, in both English and Spanish. And we have a call back system uh, of over 100 languages. Uh, we've uh, fielded over 100,000 calls. So we're in a good place. And I have worked very closely with our hospital systems, our pharmacies, our health departments. And I've really said we need to get as many shots in as many people's arms as we can. We need to do it equitably. Um, and I'm really pleased uh, where we are as a Commonwealth. This is actually a, a huge week for us. We weren't able to get our allotment last week, but we have it now. So we're putting in a, lo a lot of shots in people's arms as we speak. I think March is gonna be a 
you know, a good month for us. Uh, we've worked very closely with our president, who's been a great partner, by the way. Uh, he's allowed us to know how many doses we'll be, we'll be receiving each week over the next few weeks. So it's allowed us to plan. We have a number of sites set up across Virginia. So we have the infrastructure in place. And as soon as we can get the doses we need, uh, we need about 350,000 a week to, to get people vaccinated by the summertime. But I'm confident that we, we, we're ready. Uh, we're anticipating those doses and uh, we're gonna get them into people's arms and, and uh, get this pandemic behind us. I, I, I would say a couple things, Nick. Um, one, uh, we'll now have three vaccinations uh, uh, as, uh, by this right. weekend, Johnson & Johnson, which is a one-time shot. Uh, and then we'll have Moderna and Pfizer continue. Uh, those supplies are, are going up. So to have three uh, safe and effective uh, vaccines in Virginia uh, is very exciting. But in the meantime, Virginians, they, they need to stay uh, cognizant of the fact that this virus is still out there. They need to be vigilant, continue to wear their mask, the social distance and keep their hands clean. And that's how we'll get this uh, pandemic behind us. Well, the race for governor is uh, underway. There are a number of candidates in the race already and the election is coming up this year, actually. Um, any thoughts on, as far as the field of candidates, who you would like to uh, take over for you and lead the state uh, away from the pandemic? Do you have any thoughts on, on a choice yourself? Well, as you know, Nick, uh, I'm a proud Democrat, and I believe when we elect Democrats, good things happen. We've got some great candidates running. And the one thing that I will say, uh, when I do turn the keys over to the next governor, Virginia is going to be in as good a shape as it's ever been in. We've put more money into our reserve funds than than any prior governors that we'll have over two billion with a B dollars in reserve. Our economy will be back up and running again. This pandemic will hopefully be behind us. And uh, so I will feel at the end of our four years that we've done uh, a good job for Virginia. We've left Virginia much better than we found it and we'll turn it over to the next governor. And I, I anticipate that will be a good Democrat and I'll look forward to continuing to work with them, making sure that we focus on education, business opportunities, uh, the G3 program, which allows individuals to go to our community colleges without incurring debt, early childhood, so many good things that we've been able to work on will be continued uh, in the next administration. Okay, and just one last thing I'd like to ask you, uh, you, were, you were talking about the state's finances just now, and uh, I know the state is doing better than you thought it, it might. Certainly when the pandemic started, you thought the state was gonna take a bigger hit than it did financially. Uh, if you could just um, talk to business owners directly here. Uh, a lot of business owners have been uh, shut down or, or forced into restrictions that have uh, devastated their business and their, their financial lives, their personal financial lives. Um, what would you say to a business owner like that who, who just wants these restrictions over with, who wants to be done with this and get back to business as usual, and who's frustrated with government leaders telling them what they can and can't do with their own business. What's your message to them uh, right now as we enter this one year period since all of this began? Yeah, that's a great question, Nick. And I, I'm a small business owner. I'm a, a co-owner of our medical practice in Hampton Roads. And, and this has been a difficult year, especially for small businesses. There are a number of businesses that are no longer with us. So many folks have, have been unemployed, uh, lost their jobs. But we've had you know, several uh, uh, programs in place, our Rebuild Virginia uh, program, where we've reached out to, to help small businesses. Uh, we've uh, invested uh, over $100 million uh, into that, and we'll put more into that as uh, this budget that we'll be signing in the, in the near future. So we're doing everything that we can to get our businesses back up and running. But one of the things that I am so proud of, Nick, is that Virginia uh, is the number one state in this country in which to do business. And that is very important to me. Uh, I just got off the phone uh, with a company that's coming to Virginia over uh, a $1 million investment, number of new employees with, that'll be coming to Virginia. We talked about the importance of our talented workforce. We talked about our business friendly environment. So uh, I think Virginia overall is in a good place. No doubt businesses have sacrificed over this past year, but 
uh, they sacrificed because we were in the middle of the worst pandemic that any of us had ever seen. And so we'll get back on our feet. And as I said earlier, I really think that Virginia is going to come out of COVID-19 in a stronger position uh, than we went in. Uh, and one last thing I'll say, Nick, um, Virginia is an anomaly right now in the, in the business sector. Um, I just uh, provided, uh, Virginia just provided 732 million additional dollars to our, our budget uh, leaders. Um, a lot of states would like to have that problem. And, and so while we had to unlock when COVID-19 uh, outbreak occurred, we've been able to reallot uh, those things that uh, uh, were priorities for Virginia. Um, and one of those coming out of COVID-19 will be to help small businesses get back on their feet, to help people get back to work. The G3 program, which will help individuals go to our community college with colleges without incurring debt. It will allow Virginians to be trained and retrained so that they can get back into the workforce. So we're in a good place in Virginia, and I'm, I'm just very proud of our administration and the great work that they've been able to do. Okay, Virginia, Governor Ralph Northam, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Nick, stay safe out there. Thanks so much. Yeah.